this talk. So what I'd like to talk about today are uh, some elements. So, so I should start with a preface, which is that I'm not a mathematician. I am an unwashed applied physicist. Uh, and the mathematics that I use is of a very blue collar variety. Uh, but what I will uh, hopefully expose you to today is the notion that there is a revolution going on in photonic materials design. Uh, and this actually, I think, has the potential to be extreme, have an extremely large impact on this field of solar and renewable energy. Uh, and that's really at the core of the kind of work that we do, both uh, uh, in terms of design and theory and, and, and experiment. Uh, so the backdrop to my first slide here is uh, an image known as the world at night. It's a time-lapse photograph of the light emission from the Earth's surface. Uh, it's literally an image of electricity use. It is also a proxy for worldwide energy use. Uh, and worldwide energy use, the United Nations will tell us, is in fact uh, directly linearly correlated with per capita GDP and the Human Development Index. Basically, it's an indication of the quality of your life. So you can see that uh, in the United States and in Western Europe uh, and in Eastern Asia, those bright spots on the map indicate uh, that those are places where we are using a lot of electricity, we're creating a lot of light, out, spewing light out into space at night, uh, and as a result, we enjoy a relatively high quality of life. You can see there are also large areas of the Earth that are quite highly populated that are dark. Uh, some of those areas that are dark and are uh, sort of half lit are going to become lit in the next 50 years to 100 years because indeed uh, the life, uh, you know, the standard of living that we enjoy is uh, one that is uh, 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 widely envied and in fact there's uh, the, the, one of the biggest challenges facing humanity is uh, the uh, anticipated energy, increase in energy use that's going to accompany this huge worldwide development as so uh, uh, in addition to, uh, of course, the uh, current issues that we have with uh, energy use, uh, uh, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, which automatically uh, means that we face a choice between uh, uh, altering our climate and, and use of energy at the moment. So in the course of this, I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, photovoltaics, uh, solar energy, uh, generating electricity from sunlight, uh, and some of the elements that uh, either enable or limit the scaling of solar e electric energy conversion to this worldwide scale. So we're interested in ultimately having an impact on the global scale, and so that's a scale of terawatts of electricity production, uh, which is an almost unfathomable scale, uh, but that's the scale where one can have impact. And so what we're going to see from that motivational standpoint is that that will motivate the notion of optical design in materials that enables us to dramatically enhance their absorbance. Uh, that'll enable us to use uh, less material uh, and w is a critical element of uh, enabling the whole enterprise to go to this terawatt scale. So I'll describe also some designs, of some fairly unusual designs of photovoltaic cells that have uh, elements in them that enable us to enhance the absorption. Uh, and then uh, at the very end, I'll talk about uh, a new class of materials that are being designed by applied physicists, engineers, physicists, and mathematicians called metamaterials, which um, are essentially a, a, a design space for materials uh, that have very, very unusual properties. Uh, and so the work itself is carried out by, largely by a, a very talented group of students and postdocs at Caltech. Uh, and we have also a number of senior collaborators, Albert Pullman, who's with whose group in the Netherlands. We've had a long-term uh, research interaction. And Harvey Mudd's uh, own uh, Peter Sayeta from the physics department here is an active collaborator. He spent his sabbatical in our group. And I'll describe some of the work uh, that Peter has done in my talk. Um, so, uh, so one of the things about uh, uh, energy is that it's now something that is uh, in the public uh, light uh, almost daily, and uh, it's a uh, preoccupation and it's highly motivational for many of the uh, students coming into our campuses. Uh, 
and whether or not you are uh, a person that cares, you know, on, on, on the very far political right that cares m most about energy independence and security for the United States and for other countries, or whether you are prim your primary concern is climate change, uh, you can uh, nod your heads in unison in agreement that indeed changing our consumption patterns of energy and changing the whole energy infrastructure uh, to move away from a, a fossil fuel uh, dominated uh, energy infrastructure is an urgent priority. Um, so if we look at uh, fossil, uh, at ener worldwide energy consumption, we can see that almost 90% of it at the moment is Con, uh, is uh, comprised of use of uh, coal, gas, and oil. Uh, and only a small fraction of it is generated in any carbon-free manner, principally through hydroelectric power, nuclear, and a tiny fraction coming from all other renewables, an almost insignificant fraction coming from solar energy. So the, the reality is at the moment that solar uh, is having a negligible impact at, at the worldwide energy supply scale. The total, by the way, this, this is uh, just to sensitize you to this rather large number, seven te uh, uh, 17 terawatts, that's 17 trillion watts. That's the instantaneous burn rate of the globe. Uh, and uh, so uh, just to, to get some sense of what that uh, implies, uh, imagine you, if, if some of you got up this morning and used a 1,000-watt hair dryer to dry your hair after you got out of the shower. Uh, imagine that every person on Earth uh, ran three hair dryers continuously, 24 hours a day, so, uh, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That is about 17 trillion watts. Uh, and so uh, that's an enormous uh, uh, energy consumption, and it's an enormous challenge to think about how we could uh, derive uh, the majority of that uh, energy from carbon-free sources. So one of the things, photovoltaics, one of the reasons that it is such a small fraction of the total is that uh, historically solar has been too expensive to be considered uh, as a, a source of subsidy-free uh, uh, energy. In fact, solar has survived in largely in uh, both the United States and elsewhere uh, because of rebate and uh, feed-in tariff programs, uh, most notably in Germany where solar has had a large uh, expansion in the last uh, uh, five to ten years. But we are now, uh, this is something that I think many people don't recognize, uh, but I wanted to show this, is that we're, we're now reaching the point where the, where the photovoltaics technology and the photovoltaics marketplace is really reaching a tipping point. This is a plot here of the, it's, it's a small print, but it's the cost of, levelized cost of uh, <clears throat> energy in cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and this sh uh, shaded yellow line here is the threshold where one becomes competitive with residential and commercial uh, electric rates. Uh, and the blue line down here, the sh shaded dark line, is uh, the uh, price for uh, utility generated electricity, about s uh, five to seven cents a kilowatt hour. And photovoltaics started out uh, in the 1990s as being an order of magnitude too expensive and has monotonically reduced in price. And right at the very moment, you know, as we sit here poised in uh, 2010, we are just about entering the point. In fact, the, if you go to solarbuzz.com and see the daily price of uh, uh, photo photovoltaic electricity, you'll see that the cost is uh, in the range of 22 to 25 cents a kilowatt hour. And if you look at your electricity bill in California, you'll find that some of the tiers that you pay for electricity on your bill are above that rate, uh, but the average rate that you pay is probably a bit below. But sometime in the next 10 years, we are going to reach a point where the cost of photovoltaics competes on an even basis without subsidy uh, with sources of central utility uh, generated uh, fossil fuel fired uh, 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 generation methods for electricity. And at that point, it's widely anticipated that the market is going to explode. And there, that is the reason why uh, th th all of the Fortune 100 co co uh, companies in the United States and around the world are making large investments in photovoltaics at the moment. So one of the other reasons we're interested in solar energy is because uh, it's, the, it's the big game in town. If we look at the entire uh, energy flows into the, uh, into the earth, we see that the vast energy flow, of course, and essentially our our, our uh, 
our major energy source, uh, aside from geothermal energy, is uh, flows of energy from the sun. And, and the numbers here are, are enormous. Our resource exploitation of solar energy is a tiny fraction of this total flow. Uh, so what this really tells us is that relative to limits and relative to our, uh, our, our consumption, the available resource is enormous. This is a very interesting chart. I don't have time to go through it. It's quite busy. It's available from the site, uh, website of the Stanford Global Climate and Energy Project, and it shows, for example, some of the uh, energy uh, reserves that we have in fossil fuel energy, uranium, and other sources of nuclear energy here. The units are amazing. Uh, Zeto joules, uh, 10 to the 21 joules, the numbers that you, prefixes that you probably uh, don't use on a daily basis, uh, and uh, terawatts and so forth. So it's, it's, I encourage you to look at this. Uh, so if you look at this in a, in a, in a sort of break it down and, and uh, give you, uh, what I've tried to do here is to represent the volume of the spheres here of a, of a, of a, of a uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, figurative planetary system of energy su supply sources, solar versus hydro, wind, biomass, geothermal, and so forth, relative to global consumption. You can just see from this, uh, from this, uh, uh, sort of comparison of the volumes of these uh, spheres, that uh, the, the, the resource for solar uh, clearly outstrips uh, uh, and, uh, uh, the global consumption and uh, a tiny fraction of this total solar resource would need to be tapped. Whereas, for example, many of these other sources which are equally important, and wind, for example, which in favorable, sighted, uh, favorable sighting locations is already uh, competitive with grid-connected uh, uh, fossil fuel-generated power um, may be more resource-limited because of the number of favorable sites for wind. Uh, but solar uh, is, 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 a, is a huge and abundant resource. So this, sunlight is not a limitation. What about land? So here's a map of the solar resource in the United States. And you can ask the question, uh, how much land would be required to generate all of U.S. electricity use? Uh, suppose we were to compactly uh, arrange a uh, photovoltaic array with 10% module efficiency in this portion of the southwestern United States. You can see this uh, uh, patch of land here between Albuquerque and Phoenix uh, would be what would be required. It's a large amount of land, but it's not a ridiculously large amount of land. Uh, suppose we now grant me the conceit that I had some mechanism for unity conversion efficiency for interconversion between electricity and other forms of useful energy that we use, like fossil fuel energy for transportation, industrial heating, and so forth. Uh, that's a fiction, but of course it's not wrong by more than a factor of two or four or five or something like that. But you can see uh, this would be the land area required to generate all, using that uh, assumption and 10% uh, module uh, efficiency, all of U.S. primary energy. So that, again, is a large amount of land, but it's not a ridiculously large amount of land. So, for example, compared to the biofuels debate that we've had in the public uh, arena uh, in the last few years, uh, where uh, the, we found, uh, after people did correct back of the envelope calculations, that, in fact, in, to fuel a significant fraction of the U.S. fleet, we would need more than the available U.S. arable land area uh, to uh, for grow uh, uh, crops, which could be... Uh, fermented in biorefineries uh, to create biofuels. So the, these are large land areas. In fact, this land area is about uh, equal to the amount of land that we have already allocated uh, in the United States for roads and utility rights of way. So it's about 4.5% of the land area. Uh, and so if you think about photovoltaic uh, panels lining the medians of divided highways and utility rights of way, you get about the right sense of scale for the enterprise that would be needed to generate a very significant fraction of our total energy from uh, solar energy. Yes? No, they don't take into account transmission losses. So I, I said grant me this fiction of unity conversion efficiency and so forth. So I said, uh, you know, grant. So, so the real number might be a factor of two or four or five uh, different Maybe I need, need more land or something like that. Uh, but, but the, uh, yeah, so generally speaking, uh, for uh, 
for transmission, you can lose 20% uh, 20, 20 of the uh, energy for long-range uh, transmission uh, uh, in transmission from a, say, a centralized utility plant over hundreds of miles to the, to the source. So there are inefficiencies in the grid, there are inefficiencies in conversion and so forth. But I'm trying to just give you a sense of scale. Yeah. Um, so what about materials? Is it conceivable that if we were to build this uh, 10,000 square mile plant, photovoltaic plant, uh, to supply all of the energy in the United States, we would run up against intrinsic material resource limits? So one way to think about that is to make a plot of the periodic table, but not in the Mendeleev uh, periodic table that chemists are familiar with, but in a fashion that geologists are more comfortable with. And this is a plot of the abundance of elements in the Earth's crust versus the atomic number. So up here you can see uh, oxygen and silicon, which are the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. And for those of you who are sitting in back, this plot spans 15 orders of magnitude. Okay, so that's a lot of orders of magnitude. Um, and so now let's imagine we're going to construct one terawatt's worth of photovoltaics uh, using an optically thick solar cell, enough, enough material to absorb all the light, uh, with 15% conversion efficiency to generate uh, a terawatt, so that determines the land area needed. Uh, and so roughly speaking, where this blue dotted line lies is the line of demarcation between elements that are abundant enough above the line uh, and inabundant uh, below the line uh, with respect to that goal. So it turns out that the commercially uh, important thin film photovoltaic uh, technologies that are alternatives to silicon technology. Silicon technology, in fact, is the major uh, techno commercial technology for photovoltaics, but it is also more expensive than these thin film alternatives, which are growing rapidly. These thin film alternatives, which are now in, uh, taking up an increasing fraction of market share, uh, involve uh, materials like copper, indium, gallium diselenide, and cadmium telluride, which uh, particularly the anions here in the uh, chemical compounds are among the rarest elements in the Earth's crust, which is an unfortunate choice. And that means that while you can make a few gigawatts of uh, photovoltaic uh, thin film uh, modules using these materials, it will not be possible to uh, scale these materials to the terawatt level. So we will have to find other ways to uh, cope with that uh, abundance issue. Of course, one way is to think about and develop an entire uh, area of materials physics where we learn how to make uh, useful semiconductors out of all these materials, the earth abundant mineral forming elements. Uh, and silicon is one example. Uh, and there are many other compounds. We're working on uh, things like copper oxide, iron disulfide, zinc phosphide, developing the new, uh, essentially a new material science of these uh, semiconductors and learning more about them. These are, these are quite unconventional relative to the semiconductors that have been developed for electronics and optoelectronics. Another option would be to find a way by enhancing the absorbance of the material to essentially lower the threshold, lower the amount of material consumed per cell or per unit area so that you could tolerate the use of some of these relatively rare materials by enhancing light absorption and reducing the semiconductor volume. And in truth, you would probably want to do both. Use both more abundant materials and also use less of them. Uh, so here's where the mathematics comes in. This is a mathematics conference, and I'm not a mathematician. I'm not going to tell you much about math that you don't already know. But I, what I did want to tell you is that there is a really interesting revolution going on uh, in which people are designing artificial photonic materials. And their artificial photonic materials are some functional material that takes waves that have a dispersion relation, frequency versus wave vector, uh, uh, which in free space is represented as a linear dispersion relation. So in free space, uh, the slope of that uh, dispersion relation would just be the speed of light. Uh, uh, and uh, a wave propagation vector is uh, frequency over the speed of light. Uh, if I change the refractive index in a homogeneous material, it just changes the slope of that line. It stays linear. But there are artificially designed photonic materials that can do strange things, uh, that can uh, make these dispersion curves very flat. Uh, the s significance of that is that now, for example, the group velocity, which is the slope of this dispersion relation, uh, d omega dk, um, can be very slow. Uh, and you can slow down light in these materials and therefore enhance their absorption. You can even make the slope of these dispersion relations be negative. 
and make phase and group velocity propagate in opposite directions. Uh, and if, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and how the, some of the curious properties of these artificial photonic materials manifest themselves. In any case, there are subunits that are wavelength scale or subwavelength scale that enable this transformation. In general, physicists have figured out, and this is where the mathematics comes in, how to do these things uh, to build little structures that change the dispersive properties of the materials with respect to light propagation. However, uh, they are not very adept, uh, but mathematicians are, at the inverse problem. In other words, saying, I want to have some dispersion relation. Tell me what little units to build here. Okay, so that's where you guys can, uh, I think, uh, play a big role, uh, whereas we are, uh, in, in, for the most part, uh, always thinking about these units and how we can make them and uh, how we can design them and uh, what, what's practical and so forth. And I think that might be a real opportunity for mathematicians. Uh, so let me say a little bit about the sun. Uh, that, first of all, the uh, sun, uh, to the great disappointment of many of my students, is not a laser. It is not monochromatic and coherent. Uh, when you spend life doing experiments on an optical table, you expect every light source to be a laser. Uh, and the sun is spectrally broad. In fact, it is nearly a black body spectrum, nearly the, the, the Planck uh, distribution. You can see these dips are due to atmospheric absorption lines to the gases in the upper atmosphere. Um, and the other feature about the sun is that it doesn't stay put. Uh, it keeps moving relative to your photovoltaic cell. That means that the angle of incidence, even if you have direct illumination uh, on, the, uh, on the surface, uh, changes throughout the day. Uh, the, the sun, from, as, as viewed as a uh, uh, under d uh, direct illumination, in other words, uh, on, a, on a clear day where the sun comes directly uh, in a ray optic sense uh, and impinges on your material, it has a relatively small convergence angle, uh, a, a fraction of a degree, but it changes during the day. And so if you have some material that has angle-dependent absorption, you have to think about that. And then, of course, if you live in a cloudy environment, the sun is scat the instant sunlight is scattered by in in uh, in vapor water vapor usually uh, primarily in the upper atmosphere, and the overall uh, angle of incidence power distribution uh, at any time of day is quite broad. So uh, you have to be able to cope with these in make designing your uh, your materials. So let me say a little bit about what a uh, solar cell is. This will be the only uh, physics slide about. Uh, how solar cells work. Uh, I'll say a little bit about the fundamental efficiency limits. But basically, solar cells have to do two things. They have to absorb sunlight, uh, and they have to take the photo-excited charge carriers and sweep them into the external circuit where they can do work on an external load and, and therefore create energy. Uh, so that means we have to have a layer that's thick enough to absorb the sunlight. But in order for the charge carriers to make it out, they have, the material has to be high enough quality uh, to enable those charge carriers to make it out with, without getting trapped somehow in the material. And typically materials that are of lower purity and lower intrinsic uh, crystallographic quality have more traps and prevent the charge carriers from making it into the external circuit. So as usual in the way of these things, uh, the more expensive, high purity, high crystal quality materials have higher conversion efficiency. Uh, and thin films that are polycrystalline and relatively impure have lower conversion efficiency for this very fundamental reason. Uh, so uh, the other thing that we require is an internal electric field. That internal electric field, as the carriers migrate through their electric field, uh, creates uh, the uh, electric uh, potential energy difference uh, that enables those charge carriers as they come into the external circuit to do work on the external load. And that internal electric field is usually generated by uh, a modulation of the material uh, in uh, changing its uh, electrochemical uh, potential inside the material. Uh, we call this doping in semiconductor physics, where we make layers that support primarily conductivity of electrons and uh, primarily conductivity of holes, which are a fictitious quasi-particle that we invent that uh, describes the uh, dynamics of uh, electrons in a material where there are very few of them. Um, so anyway, that's the basics that you need to know about a solar cell. It absorbs the light. Uh, there's an internal electric field uh, such that when the carriers migrate across that uh, internal uh, dipole field layer, uh, create a, 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 ch a change in potential energy that does work on the external circuit. Um, so the other thing that's interesting to know about solar cells and uh, the, where the, where the, uh, the, the, the uh, 
fundamental statistical mechanics uh, comes into play is determining the limiting efficiency for a solar cell. And the, uh, one of the seminal uh, uh, papers in this field, uh, in this uh, field of inquiry about limiting efficiency for photovoltaics was written by Shockley, who uh, won the Nobel Prize for his work on semiconductor physics and for the invention of the transistor. Uh, in 1961, he and Hans Joachim Kweiser uh, used a detailed balance model uh, to determine the limiting efficiency of a solar cell. Uh, and what they did was to say, imagine that the sun were impinging on a solar cell, which was an ideal black body right here. Uh, and that ideal black body was at zero Kelvin, and the sun came from all, all directions, from four pi to radiance. Of course, this is a, a sun that, w uh, this is unlike the sun that we have, uh, and uh, we can't cool our materials to zero Kelvin. Uh, th that would create the conditions where uh, in, if we think about the electromagnetic or thermal equilibrium between these things, uh, would g generate the highest efficiency. Uh, and in the process of considering this kind of uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, detailed balance between the sun and your absorber, they thought about what happens when you have finite uh, uh, temperatures. Uh, and at finite temperatures, the thing that ultimately limits the efficiency of a solar cell is that some of these charge carriers uh, that uh, that are created by absorption of sunlight recombine with each other, and in recombining, they emit light. So fundamentally, the limiting efficiency of a solar cell is determined by the fact that it acts parasitically as a light-emitting diode. Uh, so when you get rid of all of the other non-ideal uh, aspects that limit the efficiency of a solar cell, in fact, we can do this. It's silicon and gallium arsenide and a couple of other materials have been developed at material purity limits such that we can get rid of all of the other non-idealities except this one, where we have this uh, parasitic re-emission of light that limits the efficiency. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, that's right. So by the way, speaking of thermodynamics, uh, there's also another very interesting feature, uh, which is that uh, in a semiconductor, we absorb light across an energy gap uh, that has some, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, light is absorbed across a, a region where there are no electronic states and there's a gap in energy. Uh, and that energy gap uh, w is uh, the um, absorption threshold for the light. Now you might think, well, uh, at first, that the voltage I would get out would be equal to the charge times the uh, uh, electrostatic, uh, the charge times the uh, voltage, electrostatic potential, would just be equal to that energy. Uh, but it turns out that there's a de deficit between the energy gap uh, and that uh, 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 energy due to the uh, open circuit voltage or potential on the solar cell. And that's due to the fact that photons have a, 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 uh, uh, a uh, source of entropy that uh, we, we also can't get rid of. Uh, and that's in the fact that when uh, uh, sunlight comes in uh, and strikes uh, my material, it comes in with a well-defined electromagnetic mode. When light is re-emitted, this so-called process of spontaneous emission that was first described by Einstein uh, involves emission into any direction at random. So, uh, so the number of modes then is all of the modes in four pi to radians, and that gives rise to a source of photon entropy. And that photon entropy, if you now calculate the uh, number of uh, the number of configurations here is uh, uh, times the thermal energy, gives rise to a uh, energy deficit between the absorption threshold and the voltage you get out of about 300 millielectron volts. So it tells you there's always an offset between the absorption threshold or the energy gap of a solar cell and its voltage that it can produce, its maximum voltage. And this tells you, among other things, that you wouldn't want to make a solar cell with an energy gap much below about, say, 8 tenths of an EV, because when you subtract off 300 millivolts, you get only a half a volt out. Uh, and below, say, half a volt, it becomes relatively impractical to uh, to build a solar cell. Um, so let's say a little bit about solar cells. The first solar cells were developed at Bell Labs uh, following the invention of the transistor and other uh, diode-like devices. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> and uh, they quickly, within a few months, reached uh, conversion efficiencies of a few percent, and within about two or three years got to about 10 percent. So it was quite a, quite a spectacular achievement. And there has been, over the years, for every type, this is a very busy slide that I won't go through in detail, <coughs> but these are different colors of lines represent different kinds of photovoltaic technologies. These are here polymer thin films that are relatively recent and currently low efficiency, uh, amorphous silicon thin films, uh, copper indium gallium diselenide thin films that I talked about earlier, uh, polycrystalline silicon, single crystal silicon. Uh, and then what I wanted to draw your attention to were two things. One is that this is the line here for single crystal silicon. You can see that the last efficiency record was set uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, and that tells you that the uh, uh, physical processes that limit the efficiency of a silicon solar cell are sufficiently well understood that nobody has made progress for 10 years. Uh, however, there's another class of solar cells where you can see here the efficiency has risen monotonically over the years. Uh, and in fact, the most efficient cells are actually made here at the other end of the 210 freeway by Spectrolab in Silmar, California. They're the world record holders for uh, photovoltaic conversion efficiency. Uh, over 40%, and these involve uh, multi-junction solar cells that absorb light across uh, multiple subcells. And the way that works is the following. Can I interrupt you? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, for those, for, for one, the, the cells are the Yes. They are not. I, I'll get to that in a moment. Yeah. So uh, they are made with uh, materials that were given to us from the optoelectronics industry for making lasers and so forth, things like gallium indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, gallium indium arsenide, and so forth. Uh, gallium arsenide is not inherently inabundant. It's relatively expensive to make right now. That could change if you came up with a uh, – but, but the cost of making these cells is rather high. Uh, the reason you would do it is because – if we, think about the, here, if we think about the absorption of photons in a, in a semiconductor, there's a threshold of energies, this energy gap, uh, and below the energy gap, uh, a semiconductor is transparent. It is an insulator. It's a, uh, so photons are transmitted right through when the photon energy is less than the energy gap. If the photon energy is exactly equal to the energy gap, we create an electron hole pair. Uh, if the photon energy is substantially larger than the energy gap, what happens is these carriers are produced with initially with the uh, energy separation of the equal to the photon energy, but then uh, the, these excited carriers rapidly lose their excess energy above in excess of the band gap energy uh, uh, by conversion to heat, uh, it converts to phonons or heat. So there's a def there's a, essentially a quantum defect between the photon energy and the band gap energy, which means that. For energies, for photons, uh, say, in the blue range here, 500 uh, nanometers, uh, the amount of power in the solar spectrum here that uh, exists uh, is much smaller than the fraction that we can usefully harvest in a single solar cell. Uh, and that's purely, even though we've absorbed all the light due to this uh, uh, deficit between the photon energy and the excited carrier energy. And then this is, this is the shaded region here is the amount of energy we can extract from the solar spectrum for a single uh, solar cell. If we were to stack in a multi-junction cell the cells with different band gaps one upon the other, now we can tile the absorbances of these uh, different subcells throughout the solar spectrum. You can see that the overall shaded region here is much larger uh, than the shaded region coming from a single cell. Uh, and then these are wired here back to back electrically in series so that the uh, overall voltage coming out is uh, equal to the sum of the voltages across the subcells. Uh, and that's the source uh, of the uh, efficiency gain in these uh, complex multi-junction cells. So they're relatively complex to make. They involve multiple layers, and I have to make interconnections between them. These are some cells of this variety that we've made in our laboratory. Uh, and uh, they involve, this is a design here, for example, that uses four su uh, subcells, gallium indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide phosphide, and indium gallium arsenide, each absor absorbing at a different uh, photon energy range. So these types of cells, because they are relatively expensive, are used in uh, practical applications in a case where the cell area is much smaller than the aperture area of the uh, a photovoltaic receiver that's used to uh, 
uh, receive the sunlight. They're used in so-called concentrator systems where we have a large optical area and we take this relatively expensive uh, material and we collect the light over an optical aperture that's much larger than the cell area. Uh, so we effectively, uh, this is equivalent to uh, covering uh, a region of uh, space with unconcentrated sunlight uh, with a you know, planar thin film, uh, but we're, we're now able to do so uh, with a relatively smaller here in, in the case of a 1000x concentrator, which is in fact uh, practical with material that uh, it takes a, of a thousand x uh, smaller area than would be required for unconcentrated sunlight. So arguably uh, you could use materials that are uh, of order a thousand x more expensive in such a system uh, in order to uh, reach the same cost per unit area. Excuse me? Uh, so heat, the, the, actually these, uh, uh, these receivers here, these are made by solar systems. These are located in the Australian outback. Uh, at the focal plane of this parabolic mirror sits a dense array of solar cells that's water cooled and so forth. The power density is enormous. Uh, and so you do have to worry about heat. Uh, and there are other practical designs. Uh, if you make the uh, concentrator area smaller, say, a few centimeters to up to the size of a dinner plate, then the total amount of power at the focal plane per cell goes down and you can use uh, just conventional uh, passive cooling to, to, to cope with that. But, but you're right, the, uh, the concentration of sunlight also means that inherently we're concentrating heat. But there is an interesting feature here, which is that if we look at such a cell, it turns out that the open circuit voltage, which is the ratio of the photocurrent over the dark current, if I do manage to cool it so I keep it at constant temperature, the, uh, the photocurrent goes up here significantly, whereas the dark current, which is just due to the thermal generation of carriers, stays the same. So the efficiency of a cell can actually go up logarithmically with the concentration factor of sunlight. So concentrator cells are more efficient. Uh, so another way I could think about doing concentration would be to simply make my film thinner. Suppose I can make the film thinner and still absorb all of the light, then the excitation level uh, in the material would be the same, or would be, uh, the, the amount of light absorbed would be the same, but in a smaller volume, the excitation level would be much higher. Uh, so uh, that is the approach that we are interested in taking with flat plate uh, uh, solar absorbers that don't involve lenses and mirrors to create optical concentrators. Uh, and so this uh, performance benefit was first uh, recognized uh, in uh, modeling and calculations by Martin Green at University of New South Wales uh, about 20 years ago, uh, who saw that, for example, for a silicon solar cell, if you were to somehow be able to absorb all of the light, you could increase the uh, cell efficiency by uh, about 15 uh, per, uh, a relative percent uh, by uh, simply and, and use uh, 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 more than 100 times less material uh, I in, this, in this balance. So this is the direction that we're interested in going. Now, the problem, of course, is that for most materials, if you thin them down, they become transparent. That is, the, uh, the absorbance of the material is finite. As you make it thinner, uh, less than the absorption length in the material, some of the light comes through. Uh, and this is a plot that uh, Peter Saeda uh, very nicely made. Uh, for silicon for showing the uh, spectral uh, absorption or spectral uh, uh, quantum efficiency for silicon and the, and the darkest shaded region here of gray is uh, uh, five uh, millimeters thick uh, and the thinnest one here is 100 nanometers. And you can see here that this thin uh, cell cr uh, collects and generates, um, collects less light and generates uh, much less photocurrent than the a very thick one. And in fact, the, the thickness where there's a, a, a rapid transition, and this is purely a consequence of the finite absorption of silicon, is in the range of about 10 to 50 microns. We start losing a large fraction of the absorbance in the red part of the solar spectrum. So uh, the f first uh, s uh, sort of analysis of light trapping that is, so if we wanted to increase the absorbance of material, we think about what could we do to it to trap light. Uh, and the first treatment of this uh, done by uh, Eli Yablonovich about 25 years ago uh, used a detailed balance 
between light absorption and light re-emission from a material of refractive index N, assuming that it was randomly rough. In other words, the, the uh, surface was had uh, 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 roughness at random length scales uh, so that the uh, emitted uh, power was the same across all regions of the spectrum. He assumed in this case that the rough scale of the roughness was much larger than the wavelength, so we could use geometrical ray tracing optics uh, to describe the paths of the light beam in the material. He also assumed that the sheet was optically thin, uh, and in this analysis, his conclusion was that the intensity enhancement you could achieve by roughening an initially planar sheet would be about two times the uh, refractive index squared. So for a material like silicon, the refractive index is three and a half. This is about a factor of 25. And in fact, if you put a, uh, a mirror back reflector on the back of this, you can get it up to about 50. Uh, and for many years, that was thought to be the limit. You couldn't get any higher than this limit of uh, two times the refractive index squared. Uh, so the entire uh, strategy that was adopted by people in the photovoltaic community was simply to roughen the surface of their solar cells in order to enhance uh, light trapping to achieve this so-called ergodic or random uh, light trapping. So we, uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, starting uh, about five years ago, began work on a type of solar cell. It, the, the initial work was motivated, actually, uh, by uh, a uh, project in, in which we were making uh, semiconductor nanowires in dense arrays, uh, and we were interested in making solar cells uh, as a way uh, in which the uh, collecting junction uh, would enable uh, the collection of carriers more efficiently than in a planar solar cell because the characteristic length that the photoexcited carriers would have to move to be collected by the junction in a case where the junction wraps around each wire uh, is considerably shorter than in a planar solar cell where the collecting junction um, has to be, uh, 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 where the thickness of the material has to be uh, equal to an absorption length in the material, whereas the, in this case, I can orthogonalize the direction of light absorption and carrier collection the, uh, uh, by making a long skinny rod, which is optically thick, but the distance that the photocarriers have to transit uh, could be only the wire diameter, which is uh, in, in uh, some cases a fraction of a micron uh, in size. Uh, and so with suitable modeling, we were able to show that such a cell could, in principle, be uh, very competitive with uh, planar uh, crystal and silicon cells. But this kind of solar cell uses a, a tiny fraction of the uh, material uh, by virtue of this uh, relatively sparse array of wires. Uh, so for a long time, it had been known uh, that, uh, in fact, starting in the 60s, that it was possible to use uh, uh, catalysts uh, to uh, induce chemical decomposition of uh, precursors for making silicon in the gas phase that would grow wires, uh, essentially growing like trees in a chemical vapor uh, ambient, uh, wherever there were selective catalyst particles. These are metal particles used to facilitate the growth. But this process was a relatively uncontrolled and random process. You could make wires, and you can see they're very long, and they grow uh, unidirectionally, uniaxially, and they make wires. Uh, but they're of random sizes and orientations. With some effort and work, we were able to show that we could make wires in a very perfect array over large areas. Uh, and in fact, th the ability to do so is the thing that creates a crucial distinction between something that's sort of a laboratory curiosity and something that could really become a technology. For various reasons related to the practicalities of how you interconnect, it's uh, wire, uh, how you interconnect these wires uh, and make junctions and so forth, it's very preferable to having this uh, highly ordered array. Uh, in fact, you can do this over large areas, and now we can make macroscopic uh, samples of wires here. This is, these are grown on a silicon wafer. Uh, and you can see that these wires are crystallogra crystallographically perfect over an area of square, square centimeters. So this is essentially a new material. When you look down at this material, it looks extremely black. Uh, and that's because, of course, it's scattering and absorbing light. Um, each of these wires can act like a perfectly uh, good solar cell. Uh, when we measure the uh, uh, characteristic uh, parameters of the solar cell, we find it has a quite favorable open circuit voltage, about 500 millivolts. 
uh, the efficiency of this cell lying down in an optically thin configuration, if we pluck a single wire and put it down on the substrate and wire it up, uh, is about 8%. Uh, in the upright version, uh, where their optical absorption is uh, uh, greater because of the uh, uh, greater density of the array, this uh, is expected. We haven't demonstrated experimentally, but this is expected to yield efficiencies of uh, about 14%. So very competitive with... Uh, uh, thin, thin films uh, of various kinds. So if you think about these wires, they lie in an interesting in-between regime. They lie in the regime that's essentially between macroscopic objects where we can treat the optical interactions using conventional ray optics. They're essentially wavelength scale. Uh, they're, well, they're slightly larger than the wavelength, uh, but they're close enough to the wavelength that uh, diffraction effects uh, play a role in the optical interactions in these wires. Uh, if the wires were much smaller, they would lie in this limit where uh, the characteristic feature size being much smaller uh, than the wavelength can uh, behave in some respects like an effective medium. Uh, and so we were interested in determining what factors uh, play a role in the optical absorption of these materials. Uh, experimentally, we measure this uh, absorbance using an integrating sphere where we collect uh, light both transmitted and reflected. Uh, an in integrating sphere is simply a device that is, has a reflectivity of one on the interior surfaces so that all the scattered light from the sample ends up getting uh, ultimately reflected into a photodetector. And from that, we can very quantitatively measure the absorbance. And you can see here, this is a, a compendium of experimental results. Uh, we are, because of the ability to grow wires with uh, sort of lithographic precision where we use patterns to determine where the wires grow, we were able to systematically make wires with different uh, configurations here, different patterns ranging from dense packed triangular and hexagonal square arrays, chirped where we change the period, uh, here uh, quasi-periodic uh, Penrose tilings and then also things, uh, patterns that exhibit short range, purely short range order. Uh, qu uh, qu uh, dodecagonal and quasi-random. And you can see here, this is the optical absorbance that, uh, uh, th this is a diffraction pattern taken from each of the samples just by shining a, uh, a laser pointer through it. And down below here is a map of the optical absorbance as a function of angle. And you can see that the absorbance here uh, reflects the symmetry of the array. The red regions here are regions of uh, high absorbance uh, and uh, the blue regions or regions of, of low absorbance. But so this, this structure reminds me of uh, a lot of periodic antenna array for radio waves because of the various dimensional differences. Is that a reasonable analogy? Well, um, so these, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, these, the, the spacing between these is of order of wavelength. So there are clearly multiple scattering effects uh, go going on. Um, in the, they, if they were about a factor of four or five smaller, the, uh, dis uh, the diffraction and dispersion effects would, would be, uh, uh, you know, really of the order of a wavelength. These are about four or five times the wavelength. So they're sort of in between these two regimes. Uh, then we would see very strong so-called photonic crystal and, uh, and diffraction effects, which are, uh, have the same, f for phased arrays of uh, antennas, have the same relationship uh, of uh, antenna spacing being comparable to the uh, antenna wavelength. Uh, <clears throat> but nonetheless, you can see that even in this case uh, where they're relatively... Uh, and by the way, one thing I'd point out is that these arrays are extremely sparse. The aerial packing fraction on the substrate here is ranging between a few percent, two percent, and at maximum 20 percent. So uh, uh, for, the, for the sparsest arrays here, uh, only 2% of the uh, overall substrate area is covered with wires in a projected area sense. Uh, so that, that means the overall uh, material used is 2% of that of a conventional solid, uh, dense solid uh, uh, piece of silicon. So in order to determine how much sunlight is absorbed, we uh, then integrated the uh, angle-dependent absorption uh, and knowing the uh, power spectral density in the sun as a function of angle, namely time of day, uh, we integrated this and then uh, determined for each of these patterns what fraction of the incident optical power would be absorbed in a single solar cycle, day-night cycle. Uh, and so you can do this for each one of these. I won't go through all of the details. Um, 
And we found that uh, samples uh, that have uh, very high symmetry and low density have, not surprisingly, a dip at, at noon. They look rather, rather uh, transparent when you look at, view, them, view them end on uh, because uh, there's uh, less scattering of, of incident light between them. However, by, uh, I'm going to skip over this for a moment, for, uh, by uh, putting either a, uh, a reflecting back side or putting uh, dielectric scattering particles uh, on the, uh, within the array of wires, uh, by interspersing them within the array of wires, we were able to raise the absorption of these wire samples containing a few percent of the uh, volume of silicon compared to a uh, dense solid uh, planar wafer-based silicon solar cell and have an absorbance that is uh, completely equivalent to that of a uh, optically thick, dense uh, wafer-based uh, uh, silicon solar cell. The quality, the electronic quality, the ability to uh, collect carriers here is determined by the internal quantum efficiency. That's the number of electrons collected per incident photon. Uh, and you can see here, uh, so electrically these behave very, very nicely. The internal quantum efficiency is very close to 100%. Uh, so these are high quality uh, solar cells, even though they're in this strange wire form. And upon uh, careful measurement, we were able to determine that in the red part of the solar spectrum, in fact, the absorbance of the wire array exceeds that of a randomly textured, uh, 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 randomly textured dense solid uh, sheet, in other words, a wafer that's been textured uh, in this portion of the solar spectrum. So indeed, in that portion of the solar spectrum, these structures do, in fact, exceed the ergodic limit. Uh, moreover, as I mentioned, th somewhat dramatically, these wires occupy a, small, uh, a few percent of the solid volume uh, of, a, of the equivalent wafer, which means that they're essentially equivalent uh, to a film uh, that's only a few microns thick, which uh, in planar film form would be uh, uh, quite, quite transparent. So I want to shift gears here in the few remaining minutes and tell you about some of the other kinds of uh, uh, ways that we can bring uh, electromagnetic theory and photonics to bear on this problem of light absorption. And one part of that story has to do with the <coughs> excitation and localization of what are called surface plasmons. Surface plasmons are uh, essentially electromagnetic waves that run along the surfaces and interfaces of metals and at metal dielectric boundaries. They essentially are a polarization of the electron distribution in a metal that is coupled directly to an electromagnetic field that extends into the metal and to the dielectric. Uh, and plasmons, and in fact, uh, it is the plasmons have a characteristic uh, resonant uh, frequency that lies usually within the visible frequency range. And that's because there is a characteristic natural frequency for oscillation of electrons in the metal. Uh, and that Resonant frequency for the noble metals that we know of, for example, gold, silver, and copper, lies within the visible to ultraviolet range. In fact, it's what's responsible for making copper and gold have their yellowish or reddish hue. The resonant absorption of the blue part of the spectrum makes copper and gold have a characteristic red and yellow hue. Silver, on the other hand, absorbs in the ultraviolet, so it tends to reflect equally well across the uh, uh, visible spectrum, giving it rise to a sort of colorless Behavior. So one of the things is that the dispersion, you can see here, this is a very nonlinear dispersion relation, that the dispersion becomes extremely flat at the surface plasmon resonance. And that means that the group velocity of a wave propagating on this interface at resonance is very low. So its optical absorbance is much higher than it would be uh, well below the resonance. Uh, and we can utilize that to uh, enhance the absorbent absorption or localize waves. These essentially are slow light materials. We can slow light down to less than 1% of the free space light speed propagating along these interfaces at resonance. So the, in a solar cell, the way that we can take advantage of this is to either generate uh, structures where incident sunlight is propagated through the semiconductor, which is optically thin, uh, and scattered into surface plasmon waves, so-called surface plasmon polariton modes that are wave-guided along the back metal semiconductor interface. Uh, and take advantage of the fact that the waveguide mode here overlaps with the uh, semiconductor material enhancing its absorption. 
The second way is to take advantage of small metal particles which excited near their plasmon resonance, excite uh, light and scatter them into uh, waveguide modes of a dielectric film uh, of the semiconductor material. Both of these have been shown to significantly enhance the absorbance of a thin film relative to uh, that of a, a just a smooth planar sheet. So here's an example showing this is a uh, full field electromagnetic simulation. By the way, there's a lot of mathematics and applied mathematics that's used in the, uh, we use numerical solutions of Maxwell's equations using finite difference time domain uh, techniques as a standard and routine quantitative design tool. And so it's an indispensable part of the design of these photonic materials. So we can precisely, we can do, for example, a modal decomposition and see only the surface plasmon mode or only the mode uh, of a photonic mode which is propagating in the silicon in the same, uh, essentially in the same simulation by doing a modal or wave vector decomposition. And that's really uh, important to doing an analysis, a quantitative analysis of the overall uh, light dispersion and propagation characteristics in these materials. So we can, yeah, go ahead. The, the idea is that if you couple light into a highly localized mode, uh, its absorption is highly localized. Uh, and if it's, that mode is localized in your semiconductor absorber, you have much more absorption per unit volume in that mode than you would in a plane wave mode. In other words, just a freely propagating mode through the bulk material. So not all electromagnetic modes are equal. If I have just light just entering a bulk material, it, light comes in as a plane wave. Uh, and it propagates, and the and the energy density in that plane wave is just uh, uh, is is essentially uh, fixed by the by the incidence. With uh, if I couple into a localized electromagnetic mode, I can take a, a large fraction of that incident plane wave energy and put it into a much smaller volume. So, so the goal here is to create highly localized modes that would enable us to use much thinner semiconductor absorbers. And have the same uh, same absorption. That's the idea. So it turns out that you can show, uh, as a consequence of the fact that these uh, scattering elements are sub wavelength and scale, that uh, as, as, as those of you who have done simple calculations of the uh, uh, scattering and excitation of an optical dipole, you know that dipoles, while they do have some directional dependence, they have a quite a broad angular dependence to their emission. So in fact, the absorption and emission uh, due to scattering from these sub-wavelength elements is quite dipole-like and is, uh, has a broad angular distribution. And remember at the outset I said we have to, uh, we were very interested in making materials that have broad angular acceptance because the sun uh, comes from uh, uh, different angles at once uh, in cloudy days and uh, even on sunny days uh, uh, throughout the day. So we can use also these uh, finite difference time domain simulations and sum up the uh, uh, modal density across the solar spectrum to generate a map of the total power absorbed power density and therefore a map of the uh, photo excited carrier density in these relatively complex structures. And that is a, a tremendous design aid in helping us determine. So for example, we can change this, the width and height of these bumps uh, and uh, materially affect the intensity of, photogener of, of light absorbed and photogenerated charge carriers uh, and localize them here versus here or down near the metal surface. Uh, and those are important design aids in designing the overall uh, solar cell and increasing its efficiency. Um, so these are examples of different electromagnetic modes. This is a, a cross-sectional profile of what the field uh, amplitude looks like for a surface plasmon mode. These are other transverse magnetic modes. These are transverse electric modes. And you can see each one of these modes has a different uh, uh, amplitude here uh, and di different uh, overlap with the uh, semiconductor thin film. Uh, this one's tightly localized at the metal dielectric interface. This one actually is peaked right in the middle and so forth. So you can see they have different absorbances. Uh, and they're both very different. Uh, they're all very different from a plane wave. So we're interested in then coupling power into guided modes that have the greatest absorbance in the thin film layers. Uh, 
and to determine how to place scatterers that enable us to couple into those guided modes. And this is work that Peter did with us uh, and a graduate student named Vivian Ferry over the last year and a half in doing a systematic analysis of light scattering from sub-wavelength dipole-like objects which scattered incident sunlight both into guided modes, scattering off these sub-wavelength objects, and then of course there's always some fraction of light which is scattered into uh, uh, the emission cone or re-emitted back into the free space. And so as light propagates along through the cell and encounters another scattering object, the same thing happens again. We scatter light, we scatter light into different modes and back into free space and so forth. And when you do a full analysis of this, you can find out how much the absorption is enhanced over single pass absorption of light coming once through the semiconductor material for the transverse magnetic and transverse electric modes. Um, and we can show that in material in regions where the semiconductor is optically thin, that this uh, single pass absorption enhancement over single pass uh, absorbance can be uh, many hundreds of times for a properly chosen modes that of the single pass absorption. So a significant enhancement in the absorbance. And one of the things that Peter did that I think is quite spectacular is to show that uh, with proper uh, and careful choice of the position of these dipole scatterers such that we scatter into the right modes uh, in the portion of the solar spectrum where light is weakly absorbed in the 900 to 1100 nanometers range for silicon, if we place dipoles at the right depth in our material, we can generate uh, an enhancement over single pass absorption that exceeds this ergodic limit. In other words, the limit that was about five minutes. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, yeah. Uh, and so this is significant. This shows that we've, uh, we've, we've broken the sound barrier, so to speak, with respect to light absorption for the first time. Uh, this is, it was a widely uh, assumed a fundamental limit. Uh, and, that, and in fact, it is a fundamental limit in the ray optics limit uh, but these materials uh, and, the, and the structures that uh, we're designing now are not governed by ray optics. They're governed by uh, prop propagation of modes that are not uh, ray optical. So I want to, so I'll just share with you that we have been able to show for the first time, Vivian did some nice work with a group in the Netherlands, to show that carefully designed plasmonic solar cells with periodic absorbers can actually produce solar cells with higher efficiency than those that have randomly textured back reflectors. So that's a, f and by the way, amorphous silicon solar cells are being made, uh, it, this is a billion dollar industry uh, at the moment, <laughs> more multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, applied materials up in uh, Santa Clara will sell you for a billion dollars an uh, entire factory to make amorphous silicon solar cells. So this is a fundamental advance, we think, uh, in the design of these cells. I'm just going to uh, say a few words at the end here about metamaterials, which are these strange and interesting new materials where we build uh, artificially uh, resonant objects at the sub-wavelength scale that have electric and magnetic resonances at optical frequencies. And as a consequence of having both electric and magnetic resonances can have very strange properties. They can have, for example, that they have electric and magnetic resonances, they can have regions of uh, the frequency spectrum where both the electric permittivity and the permeability can be simultaneously negative, which means, for example, that the refractive index can be less than zero, negative index materials. Uh, and we have shown, here's an example of a negative index material uh, that's been developed uh, and designed in our laboratory, which consists of a metal film in which we've perforated dielectric coaxes, essentially dielectric coaxial gaps. Here's, uh, sh shows an example of nanofabrication of such a dielectric coax gap. But there is a region here of, uh, where we can have uh, modes that exhibit uh, negative indices in the range of uh, 1 to 5, minus 1 to minus 5. Uh, so negative index is a very curious property of uh, materials in this metamaterial limit. Uh, recall that for conventional optical materials, Snell's, the Snell-Descartes refraction uh, a condition means that light is bent uh, towards the surface normal as it propagates uh, in from free space into our material uh, and the phase velocity uh, and the phase and power both flow in the same direction namely from top to bottom in this plot. The phase fronts get uh, closer together as the material index gets uh, larger. In a negative index material phase power still flows from top to bottom but in the material the phase flows 
from bottom to top. So it's a very strange uh, material. I'll just show you an example of this. This is a, in our uh, coaxial metamaterial. You'll see waves coming in. This is a full field electromagnetic simulation. You'll see a wave coming in this way. The phase fronts coming in. They're reflected. And then finally, you'll see here the overall uh, power is flowing down through this uh, coaxial metamaterial. But you see the phase fronts going back towards the interface. It's a very strange thing that doesn't happen in normal materials. So these, these are very interesting materials. We've been able to show, we have a paper coming out in Nature Materials next month that shows that these are quite isotropic in behavior if you design them properly. So we can make negative index materials that are quite isotropic. So let me just show, as a, as a teasing example, let me show you what we could do potentially in the area of solar energy if we had uh, such a material that had negative index. One of the things we know that when light impinges on a boundary and it reflects, there's a little phase slip called the goose hansen phase shift that accounts essentially for the phase delay as light penetrates uh, evanescently into a material and then comes back out. If that material has a positive index, that phase slip upon reflection is positive. With a material that has a negative index, that phase slip is negative. It's, it stops and reflects from a region back before, uh, that precedes the place where it was incident. So if you have a material that has uh, negative index, positive index, negative index, you can actually make light do this, back and forth. You can make a little resonator. That resonant frequency would be, uh, special, would be unique to the optical frequency. And so you could design a structure that would be tapered in such a way that you have a res resonator for each different frequency of light at a different point in the resonator, uh, and therefore make something that would be a spectrum splitting, splitting resonant cavity for sunlight that would separate out the red photons at the top, the yellow in the middle, and the blue at the bottom. And if I were to put solar cells that had appropriate absorbers in those regions, then collect light uh, uh, in those resonant cavities. So that's just a sort of a, uh, an example of uh, how optical dispersion design can be used to bring to bear on this. So I'm just going to finish here and mention that we have a new Department of Energy Center at Caltech. Here's uh, Secretary of Energy Chu who visited us a few months ago, um, which is working on this area of fundamental optical principles relevant to solar energy convergence. So we're interested in the electromagnetic design primarily of these materials. So I told you about these hyper light trapping solar cells that have a very interesting property that they uh, use a few percent of the uh, material volume of a silicon solar cell but can have the absorbance uh, uh, of, a, of a thick sheet. And in fact, the, they, the absorbance can exceed that of a randomly textured sheet for a certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I told you about plasmonic solar cells where we, couple, where we use sub-wavelength metal scatterers to couple light into waveguide modes. Uh, and with the help of Peter Sayeta, we we're able to show that we can also beat the ergodic limit in these materials. And I think there's a whole rich portfolio of materials, so-called plasmonic metamaterials, uh, which lies before us that will uh, uh, have uh, rich and interesting properties in their own right scientifically and may also have some very interesting uh, uh, impacts and implications for solar energy. So thanks very much. Mics, do you want to just be really loud? Okay, let's try to be loud. Um, Dick. I wonder if you could just comment on the uh, uh, technique for nanoprivatization of the metamaterials or all the way down to the wires. Uh, I'm just guessing there's a lot of etching going on or uh, how much energy is consumed? Is it, is it, you know, is it okay, yeah, very good question. Yeah, so if you're going to cover, so the question was, uh, with all this nanofabrication, you're using a lot of energy, and it's probably expensive and so forth. Uh, and indeed, we want to cover 10,000 square miles, so how are we going to do it? Uh, that's a very good question. So let me just point out uh, that these cells that uh, Vivian made, I skipped over this, these structures were made by a process called nanoimprint lithography. So if you've ever gone to uh, an uh, art and craft store, you probably have gotten uh, little things that have plastic diffraction gratings that are on a self-adhesive back. You can use them in craft projects. Uh, 
those were made by stamping uh, the plastic with something that had a metal mold that was wavelength scale and it made a little diffraction grating. So essentially what we've learned how to do now is to make nano stamps uh, that can be reused thousands or ten thousands of times that produce these nanostructured features over hundreds of square centimeters. Um, so we think we now have a the so-called nano imprint lithography, a way to do extremely low cost nano fabrication of patterns uh, in a way that would actually be cost effective even for photovoltaics. Before that you would think, wow, you know, way too expensive, maybe okay for integrated circuits, uh, never would work for photovoltaics. But there are actually uh, approaches like nano imprint lithography that could be used for uh, extremely large area fabrication. Yeah, actually, I'm sorry, I, I, for lack of time, I didn't go into the physics of this as much as I, I could have. Uh, when you do the analysis, the conclusion you come to is that the reason that this, there's a slight enhancement above the ergodic limit has to do with the fact that these long, uh, skinny wires act as uh, dielectric waveguides. Uh, they act as light pipes. Uh, so therefore, the modal spectrum you get is not just that of a random spectrum of plane waves, and those uh, guided modes actually have more light localization aggregated over the entire material than just a random spectrum of plane waves. So there certainly is scattering going on uh, and so forth. I don't think it has to do with the surface area which is, uh, it has more to do with the change mo mode transformation. So transformation from plane wave modes into other electromagnetic modes. Yeah. Well, I just reviewed a paper for Nature Photonics that claimed that they could beat the ergodic limit by a factor of 13. So I think there's a, I don't know if it's right, by the way, you know, John Hopfield, who is a famous scientist from Caltech, said there are four types of scientific papers. There's right and interesting, that's the best kind. There's wrong and interesting, that's next best. Uh, right and uninteresting, third best. Wrong and uninteresting, last, right? So uh, when you, papers come out, there's often controversy and so forth, and that controversy takes a while to get resolved. Uh, but I think it's, it's now clear that there are a number of different ways to exceed this uh, so-called ergodic limit, limit that seemed to be the limit of random mode uh, filling of plane wave modes. Yeah. 